Good evening. My name is Wendy Raley. I'm a surgical tech instructor here at Altamont Healthcare in Stockton. Tonight I'm going to be doing a lecture on laparoscopic surgery and laparoscopic surgical instruments and supplies for our surgical tech night class. This is the biggest thing that I want you guys. No test tonight, no assessment on instrumentation tonight. This is going to be strictly for you guys to get familiar with laparoscopic surgery. Laparoscopic surgery is one of those animals, and it's something that I don't want to put that by the computer. It would be just my luck. <laughs> You're going to do probably at least, at least two or three of these a day. And the funny thing about appendicitis is if you have one patient that has an appendicitis, you're going to have two more to follow. They come in threes. It's one of those weird things. If I'm on call and I have an appy at 6, I'm going to have an appy at 11, or I'm going to get called back at 2 a.m. for 1, 2. I just know it. <laughs> and every time that that's correct. Every time. But the more I do these, the faster I get at them, which cuts down on my overtime. It cuts down on how long I'm going to be there. It cuts down on how long the patient's there, too. Appendectomies can take you 45 minutes from skin to skin if you are set up correctly for it. So I'm gonna do a quick run through of all of these instruments on here so you guys can know exactly what we need. The only knife that I'm ever gonna pull out for a laparoscopy is gonna be the 11 blade. I'm never gonna pull a 15 or a 10. I need an 11 because it's got that triangular poke. I'm doing stab wounds on my patient in order to put these ports in there, okay? The very, very first thing that I wanna talk about is the instrumentation that we need to have to do laparoscopy. First thing is gonna be your camera. Okay, the second most important thing is going to be my scope so I can get in there and take a look. On your camera handpiece, you're going to have a little button or two on there. One of those buttons is called a white balance button. This is an NCCTTS question as well. When I plug this camera in and get my light cord and hook it up, I have to, what kind of what students said this morning, calibrate it. Right? There's a word we all know calibration. I'm going to want to take a lap or a Ratex sponge, and I'm going to want to hold it at the end of my scope when this is plugged in, and I'm going to want to press a button on my, on my camera handpiece that says white balance. I'm going to hold that up to that lap or that Ratex, and I'm going to look at the monitor. In this case, my monitor's here. And it's going to tell me white balance in progress, and then it's going to say white balance is complete. The reason that I need to white balance this camera is when I put this camera that's super lit inside a dark hole, if I don't calibrate the way the light hits it inside there, I'm not going to see anything. It's going to still be dark, okay? i got to be able to see inside there, and it's got to be lit up like a Christmas tree. Another thing I need to worry about is my focus. Just like a focus that we use on a pair of binoculars, right? When you look at it and it's blurry, and you just turn it a little bit to get the perfect picture, you're going to want to do the same thing on your camera for your doctor before you start the case. So you're going to want to look at something on your field, like an instrument, and look at your monitor and turn it to get the best view. Because if it's clear on that monitor, I promise you it's going to be clear inside that port for Dr. Two. Once I have that done, I'm going to tell my nurse to put my camera and scope on standby. If I left this thing on and it was facing down on a drape, the heat intensity of this thing is its strong. I'm going to burn a hole in that drape, I'm going to burn a hole in my patient. And my patient can't react to it because they're asleep. So I could cause a lot of damage. So putting that scope on standby and kind of tilting it up a little bit, right, rather than leaving it like that, I'm winning. It's not going to hurt anything like that. Okay, so that's your first thing. The second thing that I'm going to need that's super important is this guy. And this is called a varus needle. V-E-R-R-I-S, varus needle. This is my initial poke that's going to go in the belly button to begin my insufflation. Because we can't do anything laparoscopic until we blow up that belly, right, full of CO2. I need to go there because if I just start jabbing stuff in there, I'm going to jab a bowel, I'm going to jab a uterus, I'm going to cause a lot more damage in there than I want to do. So I'm going to start with this guy. I'm going to take two towel clips and I'm going to place it on either side of my patient's belly button and I'm going to clip it those piercing ones. I'm going to lift up on that belly button to create that umbilical channel. Now the, the higher I pull up on it, the better chance I have of getting that thing in through the fascia in one swoop. If I don't get it through there again, I got to pull it out, put it in again, lift up. This is a key part of blowing up that belly. It's the safest way to do it. Everybody, when you get a chance, I'm going to pass this around and let you feel it. It's got a little sharp 
little pokey thing on the end of it because this cuts through my fascia, right, in the, in the belly button area. I'm going to poke that through. And then the next thing I'm going to need is this insufflation tubing. I need this because this hooks up to my CO2, right, over on the wall that allows me to blow up that belly. Two different ends. One end I need to keep on the field with me and one end I need to throw off to my nurse. Some tubings have the same end. So I have two of these. And you're gonna be confused and go, which, which, which one do I keep? Keep the flying saucer end towards your nurse. Always remember, this little filter part that looks like a flying saucer, that goes off the field every single time, okay? I need to keep enough of this on my field so that I can hook it up once I get this in the belly, just like I want it, I'm gonna hook it up. They're gonna press a little button on a monitor and air is gonna start filling up in my patient's abdomen. And it's gonna start filling like this and you can watch it fill. Doctor's gonna go around and palpate it. It's like you do a good melon just to see if he can hear that sound in there and make sure that it's full. Once it's full, he's gonna pull this thing out and I'm gonna give him either a 10, a 12 or a 15 port and that port's gonna replace this needle in the belly button. And the way they put it in is gonna shock everybody, okay? It's a tiny little stab hole with an 11 blade, so you know it's just a poke. But they're gonna get up on like this, and they're gonna push that thing through the fascia. There's ridges on it, and it's gonna go in, and they're gonna just do like that. And it's gonna look pretty harsh when you see it on the video, right? It's gonna look harsh, but I promise you this is the easiest way perfect for the patient to recover. As soon as doctor gets that port in, I need to make sure that I hook that insufflation up to this port to maintain that pneumoperitoneum, okay? And I need to make sure that this lever is matching my tubing because if it's off, then I'm not gonna get any air back in there and I'm gonna slowly lose that insufflated belly, okay? Keeping that belly fully insufflated is super crucial because it allows me visibility in there. It also allows me room so when I start putting stuff in there that's, you know, this long, I'm not jabbing through things. I have space to jab in there. As soon as doctor gets that port, and the big one always goes in the belly button. I'm gonna pull the appendix out through the belly button. I'm gonna pull the gallbladder out through the belly button. Sometimes even an ectopic pregnancy through the belly button. Sometimes an ovary through the belly button. So your biggest port's always gonna be umbilical. Okay, always, always. As soon as I get that port in there, I'm gonna pull this thing out I'm gonna put my camera up in there. Now we're in business and now I can see what's going on. This is always gonna be your first thing. I'm gonna have to add more ports, right? I can't just do my surgery through one because then I'll be pulling that out to put a grasper in, I'll be switching. So, but I need the biggest port to be here because this is where I'm pulling my specimen out. How am I gonna get my specimen out of that thing? Okay, this is just an accessory five port. So let's say I'm taking out an appendix Let's say for example, right? Port placement is really important. Appendix, where is it? Right lower quadrant, everybody, right? Right down here. If I put my ports right over that appendix, which we think would make sense, right? Mm -hmm. But then I got something this long. And there's my appendix. It's a little bit redundant to have it right there, which is why it's important to have a big port here and my accessory ports going the opposite way. Because now when I put that grass burn there, it's gonna reach across perfectly to my appendix, okay? It's the same way with the gallbladder. I need to have my ports on the opposite side of my gallbladder because it would be kind of redundant to come this way when my gallbladder is right there. I don't need something that long to get that out, but I do need it if I'm going across. Does that make sense, everybody? Mm -hmm. So we're gonna do that on the opposite side of whatever we're working on. If I was working on pancreas and spleen, and then my ports would be on that side. Make sense? Yes. But just remember your biggest port's gonna be in your belly button. That's your biggest one. Accessory ports are gonna be on the outside. Accessory ports are good for a couple of things. Anything that's a five is gonna fit through a five port. So we need to be thinking about this size with this size. If I'm using a 12 with a five, well, I got a problem. Not gonna fit in that port, but it will for sure fit in my belly button port because it's a 12. So we need to be thinking about the size of our port versus the size of our stapler or any instrumentation that we use, right? Clearly, <laughs> that's not gonna work. But if I picked a five stapler, that's gonna work just beautifully. 
Maybe not. Oh yeah, it is. Mm. Perfect, right? Staplers. Got to have these for gallbladders. Sometimes I open them up for appies. Once in a while, right, when you get a bleeder for an appy? Three different sizes. 12, 10, 5. And you can see the dimensional differences, right? The millimeter sizes are different. So if I'm using a 5 port predominantly, then I'm going to probably pick a 5 stapler. But if I'm using a 12 or a 10, then I want a bigger one to fit in there. And I, and I need to have it, right? So stapler is kind of one of those things. Disposable, one-time use. You have a little marker up here. If you see that red start coming in, I'm, I'm out of staple. That's it when I've hit the red. you got to keep track of that, right? I have a stapler up here with staples in it so that we can all kind of touch one and see what they look like. Everybody shoot a staple, see what it's like. These are what we're going to hand the doctor. We're going to hand them to the doctor just like that. Lap surgery, there's really hard to be wrong with it, right? <laughs> just like we pass everything with the handle to our hand, like when we do our scissors and stuff, we're going to do the same thing. I'm just going to hand it to them that way, and they're going to grab it and go right in the ports. Ports vary. If you're doing a diagnostic laparoscopy, which is just taking a look, then I would say two fives. A five in the belly button and a five down here in the pubic line, just to kind of take a look. Okay, if I'm going to do something major, like take out a gallbladder, then I better have a five and, a, and some 12, a 12 in the belly button and at least three fives to get across. Graspers, things like that that I'm going to use in my little accessory ports here, allow me to grab, allows me to staple, allows me to cauterize. Anytime you see something like this with a little post on it, I can plug a bobie into that, like a bobie cord, and now this can become hot at the end, and I can use this to cauterize and cut at the same time. A laparoscopic kittener is kind of like a Q-tip. Hmm. I could use this to clean inside my ports. I have just made a mess of this table. <laughs> I can go in there and clean my ports. Sometimes yeah, you do it and it's just not a good picture. So I could go in there and clean it, right? This is also known as a blunt dissector or a laparoscopic dissector, where we can do a blunt dissection of whatever we're working on, right? Could be a blood dabber, could just be a port cleaner endoscopic kittener. Get familiar with this because you'll see these a lot. Kittners. Oh, let's see. Probably the most important instrument that I could teach you guys about is a Maryland dissector. A Maryland dissector. Basically, it's a Kelly on stilts. It is. That's a Kelly. That's a Schnitt. That's a Mosquito. It's just long. Okay, it's going to do the same exact thing for me that a Kelly would do in an open case, but it's on a handle. This is disposable, but you will have some of these in your trays at your facility, right? You'll have them disposable or you'll have them look metal, something like this, right? When you do a laparoscopic case, you're going to have a tray of these different graspers with different tips on it to give your doctors a variety, right? So you're going to have the Maryland in it, the little Kelly. You're going to have a right angle. Right? Typically, these are the same instruments that you're going to find in your trays, just on stilts. Just think of it that way, right? It's just with a long handle. All of these will fit inside your ports. Your doctor's just going to ask you for whatever one he wants, right, to get the job done. Scissors, laparoscopic scissors, typically disposable, super important for cutting suture, for cutting tissue for cutting adhesions. Adhesions are scar tissue that kind of looks like spider webs in the belly. People have multiple repeated surgeries, they're gonna develop adhesions, it's just one of those things. But I can take this little black cap off and put a bovie on there and now I've made hot scissors. So when I go in there, I can just kind of go through, and they look like spider webs, I can just go in there and pull the spider webs down, cut them with these hot scissors, cut right through, and now I can see what I'm gonna go work on. So laparoscopy, it looks overwhelming. When you look at all this stuff, like whoa. But this is so easy and so much faster and safer for your patient. I'd much rather get called in for a 45 minute case than a four hour, especially in the middle of the night, right? So get familiar with it, get comfortable with it. It's not quite as intimidating as it seems. It's really not, but in the beginning it will be until you see it done a few times. Now what happens if I have a laparoscopic case and it has to go to open suddenly? Laparoscopic to open. In other words, we're not making any progress laparoscopically or, or the gallbladder is too edematous or the appendix is too edematous. It's just so much pus in there, we're just going to open. We're going to open and get it in and out. Opening means I'm going to take on a whole new set of instrumentation. 
and a whole new different kind of a dumb mower tractor, either a Balfour or a Book Walter. And I'm gonna get rid of all this stuff. But I gotta get rid of all this stuff before I can get my new stuff. But if it's an emergency situation, I'm gonna have to move double fast. Now I could take the time and hand my nurse all this stuff real quick and she could just be grabbing it and put it on my case cart. Or I could take all this shit and put it in my basin on the side and then start taking my laps and get my major set and switch my knife blade from an 11 to a 10 because now we're gonna cut open that person and get in there and we have to move quick. So being able to convert from a laparoscopic to an open, it's kind of a fine art, but we need to be able to do it because it happens a lot, right? I had a doctor at Tamron that we knew he was gonna open, but he wanted to start this way. We knew he was gonna open, just open. But he's determined, oh, I'm gonna try it laparoscopic. I'm like, okay, you know, but every time we opened. But we got, I got really good at that conversion because of that guy. You know, as much as I sit here and complain about him, he actually made me better because I got much faster and much more organized in how to get rid of my stuff quickly, get my major set up, do my counts, get my laps, and open and be quick. And probably the first thing you're going to do is just switch your blade out and hand that 10 blade to the doctor. While he's cutting open that belly and bovine and suctioning, that's when I'm going to get rid of all the stuff and start getting my open up, right? It's a lot easier of a conversion that way if I entertain them. If their hands are busy, then I can be busy. You know what I mean, right? You feel that way too? Like, here's your knife, doctor. Go ahead, get started, play your game. I'm over here right now. So I gotta get rid of all this stuff. And I'm switching from Raytex to laps. We only use Raytex when we do laparoscopic surgery. We don't use laps. So now I gotta get rid of all my Raytex because I got an open belly. And if I lose a Raytex in an open belly, mm, not good. So get rid of my Raytex too and get my laps up there. So being able to do that conversion, they're gonna ask you about that on the exam. So you're really gonna to need to study how to do that. They're gonna ask you the steps to it, right? It's okay, you'll get there. You guys aren't gonna do this chapter for a couple weeks, but I want you to look at it and see it a little bit. I want you to get familiar with it because it's something that we do all the time. And you're gonna look forward to it. You're gonna like it so much better. You're gonna say, wow, it's so fast. Yeah, it's a lot of cords. It's a lot of little technical things, white balancing and focus and all that crap. But you, once you do it a few times, you'll get it. It's very easy, it's very quick. The patient goes home typically the same day. Yeah. So that's okay. great. We hope you enjoyed our little video and our discussion tonight on laparoscopic surgery and surgical supplies. If you have any questions or need any more information, please feel free to contact us here at Altamont Healthcare in Stockton, California. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to Altamont Healthcare on YouTube today.